So, tonight, the topic is, did anybody see the topic up there before? Alcohol. Alcohol, or as my grandmother would say, alcohol. She called it alcohol. Um, so, the Proverbs writer, Solomon, and the other two guys that wrote um, Proverbs have a lot to say about alcohol. But before we kind of get into what the Bible says about it, I wanted to just look at some, some facts from today concerning alcohol. 78.3% of people 12 and up, now remember, 12, that's young, 12 and up, have consumed alcohol in their life. 78%. 62.3 people, 12 and up, have consumed alcohol within the past year. And of that 62%, 17.8% are ages 12 to 17. So in the past year, 17, almost 18% of kids 12 to 17 have consumed alcohol. Uh, let's see, 29.5 million have alcohol use disorder. I always called it alcoholism, but evidently this is a much kinder term, alcohol use disorder. And that was from 2021. So, and that's 10% of the population suffer from alcohol use disorder. And that could include binge drinking. Um, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of data about um, college age kids and their, inc their uh, incidence of binge drinking is much higher than, than any other demographic. But this is from the National Institute of Health, and this is their, their words. This is what they had on their website. Research has shown that people who misuse alcohol have a greater risk of liver disease, heart disease, depression, stroke, and stomach bleeding, as well as cancers of the oral cavity, esophagus, larynx, pharynx, liver, colon, and rectum. Alcohol consumption is associated with an increased risk of drowning and injuries from violence, falls, and motor vehicle crashes. Alcohol consumption is also associated with an increased risk of female breast cancer, oropharyngeal cancer, esophageal cancer, especially in individuals who inherit a deficiency in an enzyme involved in alcohol metabolism and harmful medication interactions. Alcohol consumption has been linked to risk for fatal. Mm -mm. Alcohol consumption has been linked to risk for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders in the children of women who consume alcohol during pregnancy. So the National Institute of Health recognizes that alcohol is bad, right? With all these problems associated with alcohol. Now, what is alcohol? I mean, how would you how would you categorize it? or classify it. It's a drug, right? It's a drug. Alcohol is a drug. What type of drug, what classification of drug is alcohol? It's a depressant, right? It's a depressant, which depressants do what? They slow everything down, right? Just like the name says, it depresses everything. Slows everything down, slows it down. And it also, it also, to me, connotates depression. So a lot of people with depression also drink alcohol, which does what? Makes their depression worse, right? Mm-hmm. Don't consume alcohol. Right, right. So, so when you combine alcohol with certain medications, you exacerbate the effects of both. Typically, that's what happens. Um, and sometimes medications can do that, just different medications. If, if many of you have taken pain medications coupled with like a... Um, you know, anxiety medications, different things like that, they can cause different problems as well. Then when you add alcohol in there, which is a drug, it's metabolized through the liver, which about 80, I think it's around 80% of the drugs that you take are metabolized in your liver. 
So when you've got all those drugs competing for, the, for just one liver that you've got, even though you've got different channels where different things are metabolized, most of them use certain types of, of channels, enzymes, to be metabolized. And like the NIH said, if there's a person who is compromised or deficient in that particular enzyme, you may not met metabolize that alcohol or you may have difficulty metabolizing, which means it's going to affect you even worse. So there's medications that have that same problem as well. This was a staggering statistic to me too. 10.5 percent, or seven and a half million children, live with a parent that has alcohol use disorder. And 140,000 people die each year from alcohol-related causes, which is the fourth leading cause of of death. It was described as something. It wasn't, it wasn't, it's not the fourth leading cause of death. It's like the fourth leading cause of death that could be prevented, I think. I can't remember exactly how they described it, but it wasn't, I think cancer's number one. So I think tobacco, in this category, it was like tobacco, three other things, and then alcohol, which I thought that was pretty high. 31% of driving fatalities are contributed to alcohol, so that's one in three alcohol, I mean, automobile accidents, fatalities, are because of alcohol. And almost one in five visits to the emergency room are because of alcohol. So that's today's society. That's today's society. So even when we look back into Proverbs, we see that this was recognized as well as a big problem. So alcohol is not only a problem for those who consume it, right? That's the first time I think that's happened. But alcohol can be a problem for those of us who don't because these statistics prove that. So let's look and see what the Bible says. So what are some reasons that people drink? Let's look at what the scriptures say, and then I want to get some comments on, on why people might drink. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 19. Bread is made for laughter, and wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. So here he says, wine gladdens life. First of all, let's talk about the wine that's referred to in the Bible. There's, there's two different types of alcohol. One is wine and one is strong drink, I believe is how it's described. But they both have alcohol content. Does anybody know the difference in wines in biblical times versus wines and alcohol today? Do what? They were, they were, they were actually fermented, but it was a natural fermentation which means that there's only a certain amount of alcohol that grapes will produce naturally. You actually have to add something to it to increase the alcohol content, which is what they do today. So most of the stuff that I read said that alcohol content of wine in biblical times was about 3%, maybe, 3 to 4%. Now, they could add yeast to that to increase the the alcohol content, which at the most they said would be maybe 10%. So, and I'm not real up on all my brands and liquors and things like that, but from what I read that they said most of the wines produced today, um, the alcohol content could be anywhere from 10 to 20%. And then once you get into harder drinks like liquor and whiskey and those types of things, I think the alcohol content is even higher. So some people use that as an argument, you know, for drinking today. You say, well, you know, they drank in the Bible, right? They drank Bible time, you know, drinking Bible time. Jesus drank wine. It's a different, it's apples and oranges really comparing the alcohol we have today versus the alcohol in the first century, but we'll get to that as well. So Ecclesiastes 10, 19, we read that. Wine gladdens life, Okay. Then let's look at Proverbs 23 and verse 31. Proverbs 23, verse 31. 
Do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup it, and goes down smoothly. Psalm 104. Verses 14 and 15. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth good food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. So some of these reasons for drinking scripturally, I guess, were momentary pleasure, right? Momentary pleasure. Look at Proverbs 31, 6, and 7. Give, give strong drink to the one who is perishing and wine to those in bitter distress. So one reason for drinking would be because you're dying, because it could ease your pain, I guess, in death or those in great distress. Verse 7, let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. So one reason for drinking is to forget your problems. Forget your problems. Proverbs 23, 19 and 21. Hear, my son, and be wise and direct your heart in the way. Be not among drunkards or among glutinous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and glutton will come to poverty, and slumber will clothe them with rags. So, he's saying here, don't do it just because everybody else is doing it. Right? It may seem like everybody else is drinking, having a good time. So what are some reasons that people drink? Socially acceptable, okay? You'll be ridiculed, maybe, if you don't, and we'll get to that. There's actually scripture referring to that uh, in Peter when we start when we look at the New Testament. Peer pressure. What else? What are some other reasons people may drink? It becomes an addiction. It may start as recreational use like a lot of drugs do, it could lead to addiction. Do what? Loneliness, depressed, sad, alone, to forget your problems. A lot of people that have big problems drink to forget the problems that they have. People just like the taste of it. Really? I, I mean, I, I understand. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you that I, I think, I guess some people do. I, I guess they do. I guess they do like the taste of it. Yeah. They like the way it makes them feel. Liquid courage. Heard that before. So there's stages, though, to that, isn't there? When someone's drinking, there's a stage to which they do feel better. Maybe they loosen up, become more personable. But then as you continue to drink, what happens? You kind of start going downhill, don't you? I think you kind of reach a point, and then you, the more you continue to drink, the worse you get, which clouds your judgment, slows your senses, dulls your senses, and you would say and do things that you typically would not ever do, which is some of the warnings here that the Proverbs writer is telling us. It's exactly why you avoid it. More time. Right. 
Okay. You're okay. Okay. Right. So that is that is interesting, and and I've and I've also learned too that different people have a different tolerance for alcohol. So it may take you four beers to get drunk, may only take me one, or it may take me eight. I think everybody has a different tolerance level, and then. To your point, too, is, is the more you consume it, the more regular you consume it, the higher your tolerance is. Because I've, I've known people that have drank all their life, and they could sit there and drink, and you could hardly ever even tell that they even had a drink because their tolerance is so high. But now if they hadn't had a drink in three or four days, they were really having problems withdrawal symptoms, because it is a drug. It is a drug, and your body craves that drug if you don't have it. Good point. But alcohol can lead to poverty. We read that in chapter 23. It will destroy lives. Look at 23, starting in verse 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine. Those who not, those who go to try mixed wine. Now look at wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. You will be like the one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like the one who lies on top of a mast. They struck me, you will say, but I did not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. That sounds like to me somebody who is addicted to alcohol. It's seductive, right? It can alter your senses. It can give you a false sense of security. Kings and princes were, were ordered to abstain. Look at chapter 31, verses 4 and 5. It's not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and, and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. So it's better reserved for the dying and devastated. Chapter 31, I think we read that. And it will also lead you astray. Look at chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. So where does that leave us? So clearly Solomon recognized the dangers of alcohol. But what does that mean for us today as Christians? How is our attitude toward alcohol? And what should it be? What does the Bible say? What does the New Testament say our attitude towards alcohol should be? So what is condemned? Look in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So instead of wine, we're supposed to be filled with Spirit. Galatians 5.21 Go back up to go back up to nineteen. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Sounds like a pretty stern warning to me. So anything on that list, I would definitely want to avoid, wouldn't you? And, you know, we can probably go down that list and check off a bunch of things that we don't even have to worry about. 
sorcery. I mean, is there any sorcerers here? I mean, really, is a lot, a lot of things that we can go down and check this list and check off and say, look, I have no problem avoiding these. Drunkenness, I think, is one that a lot of people try to debate. What is drunkenness? Like Kevin was saying, maybe your definition of being drunk is after four beers. Well, how do you know? How do you know it's not one beer and you're drunk? What is the definition of drunkenness? I think that's what a lot of people try to debate, to try to defend their use of alcohol. So I think that's what we need to really kind of think about is what's condemned. So definitely drunkenness is condemned. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. devour. So be sober-minded. How can you be sober-minded if you've had too much alcohol? Too much alcohol. Because once you take one drink, that starts affecting your body in some way. Like I said, it affects different people in different ways. But it starts affecting you the moment you take it, as does any drug. The moment you enter it into your body, it starts affecting you in some way. Sometimes when you're in pain, you wish that pain medication would work a lot quicker. So it's no different with alcohol. It affects you in different ways, different people. So it starts affecting you the very first time that you take it. Peter's telling us we're to be sober-minded. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So Paul is telling the, the church at Corinth, don't even associate with people that are drunkards. Like Brian. I mean, everybody around him drinks all the time, right? I'm kidding. One of the things that, that I've had to deal with a lot with going to um, different meetings, like when I was with big drug companies, we would have all these fancy meetings and they would spend way too much money on food and drink, and that's, that's always right there. It's readily available. That's just part of the meeting that we had. I mean, not, we didn't drink all during the meetings, but, you know, when they would have a meal, there would always be an open bar. Or when we would go out to dinner, like if our district just went, which is a smaller group, say just 10 or 12 people, you know, everybody's ordering drinks. When it comes to me, I'll just have water. You have Coke. And they would all just, I mean, every time, they would all just kind of look at me like, what? Drink? I mean, like, I was the outcast. I was the weird one because I, I wasn't drinking. But to Brian's point, it's like, that would be such an easy thing for me to do. It would be just to order whatever and just pretend like I was one of the, you know, one of the gang. But I would always have to defend myself for not drinking. And there's different reasons you can give to people for not drinking alcohol. Um, a lot of studies have shown that alcoholism, could, you could be predisposed to that, that it's genetic. So if it's in your family, kind of like diabetes, if it's in your family, you have a high chance of developing that disease. Alcoholism is not any different. Um, and there are people in my family that have problems with alcohol, that have had problems with alcohol. So to me, that's a big concern. And how many drinks does it take you to become an alcoholic? It could just be one. It could be two. Who knows? Comments on that? No comments on that? Okay. Wayne, oh, I'm sorry, Wayne, yes. I didn't, you didn't be genetically predisposed. I think it's not just alcoholism. It's more of like addictive properties, you can be predisposed to be addicted to certain things. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and so you witnessed that firsthand, which, which I did too. I witnessed it firsthand growing up. It, and I mean, in my house, it was not a, really an issue. It was just, you know, and everybody that came over, I mean, we had a swimming pool, everybody that came over, I mean, that was just part of the festivities was just, you know, drinking. And I mean, it was something that I grew up with that I was just kind of used to seeing. You know, in a lot of countries too, um, it's their culture to drink wine with food. I know in Europe and different places like that, so I've heard, I've never been. Some of you world travelers may know more about it than I do. But it's just more culturally accepted to drink, you know, wine with a meal. Now, they may have fewer incidences of alcoholism. I, I don't know. I don't have those statistics. But what you're exposed to growing up, I think does affect you later on in life. And for you, it had a positive effect because you saw the negative side of alcohol use, not even knowing that, hey, this, because this is my family, I could be genetically predisposed to becoming an alcoholic. All it would take was one drink, and then, boom, I'm hooked. But that is, that is scientifically studied that, that do, it does happen that way. So congratulations. On not being an alcoholic. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Right. Mm hmm. Most of us know our um, temptations or where we're weak. And most of the time we learn that through bad decisions. I mean, most of the time we learn, I mean, hopefully we learn that by making bad decisions. And then you know that, say, hey, I'm, I'm weak in this area. I need to avoid that altogether. I don't need to be anywhere near that because I may be tempted in that area. Yes. It in movies or on television, commercials. Right. Right. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. You're, yeah, you're exactly right. And, and Paul does talk about that. It is in Romans, and it's right here on my little sheet where I'm getting to it. Jumped right ahead. But you make a great point is, is that part of our responsibility is our example to others. Part of our responsibility as a Christian is our activity, is what people see us doing. Right? What Jeremy's saying is, if they see us drinking, if we you know, somehow can justify that it's okay to take a drink here and there, if we influence somebody in a negative way, they look at Jeremy and say, well, Jeremy, he goes to the Church of Christ. He's, he's in there buying beer. It must be okay. Now, you know, Jeremy may not have a problem with it, or he could be buying it for... Miners or something, I don't know, your basketball team. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm joking, of course, of course. But my point is that somebody may see him doing that, and because they see him doing that, they feel like that's acceptable. 
then they begin to drink, and they do have a real problem. Maybe they are predisposed to it. So even though that's their actions and their behavior that they're going to be responsible for, you're responsible for the example that you showed. And that's clearly what Paul tells us in Romans 14. Let's look at that and see it's starting in verse 20, Romans 14, 20. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. Is it not good to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble? The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself, but for what he approves. But for whatever has doubts is condemned for if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not produce from faith is sin. So to me, that kind of talks to social drinking as well. You know, a lot of people will try to defend social drinking, saying, well, I'm not drunk. Like Kevin says, he can have one beer and he's not drunk, right? But Paul tells us in Romans that that's not really good enough. That's not good enough. If you're going to live by faith and if you're going to profess to be a Christian, then you need to show that and you need to be a good example to that. So if somebody sees that, they don't know if you've had one or if you've had 20. They just feel like you're authorizing the use of alcohol. And that's a bad example. Hmm. Just being sober. And that, you know, and that can include other things than alcohol. Right, and that's not merely a suggestion. That, that's a commandment. That's he's telling us to be sober. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and clearly we're, I, I think, I don't know if I did a good job of making the distinction between alcohol, the drug, because it's, it's not sinful to consume alcohol when it's in cough medicine. I mean, how many of us have taken cough medicine? That's got a lot of alcohol in it. But it does have a benefit, just as Paul told Timothy to drink a little wine for his stomach. It does have a benefit. What we're clearly talking about here is drunkenness, being drunk, given the perception of using alcohol in social situations where clearly the scriptures tell us that's not the example that we're supposed to give. We're not supposed to give the example of we fit in with everybody. We're supposed to be different. I mean, I'm not, I wasn't bragging on myself telling what a great person I am because I was the only one at the table that didn't get alcohol. Now, nobody ever came up to me and asked me, you know, hey, why don't, why don't you drink? They would just kind of joke and make fun or something, but we never really had a discussion about why I didn't drink alcohol. But it would have been a great opportunity to talk to somebody about some of the reasons that I don't. I mean, there are reasons that I don't other than scriptural reasons, other than biblical reasons. But it's a great opportunity to talk to somebody. What else? What other comments do you have? Because I think I heard the first bell, didn't I? Okay. And that's, and that's a constant battle because, like I said, um, we all are put in situations where we have to make a choice, and oftentimes we make the wrong choice, where if we would have made the right choice, what a great example that would have been, but we're weak and we do make mistakes. But to me, the, the beautiful thing about the gospel and the scripture is that we can be forgiven for that. As long as we're here, we have another chance make the right choice next time because we'll be faced with decisions again. So a great point. What else? Anything? 
Kenny, you haven't said nothing tonight, so you got nothing to say. Right. It was years of abuse. Right. And, you know, all the, the TV commercials, the beer commercials and stuff, they never show that side of alcohol. What, what side, did, side did they show? The good times, right? Yeah, party, having fun, good times. They don't show you the, the bad side, your car being wrapped around a tree or you dying in the hospital because your liver's failing because of alcohol. Um, so, anyway, good stuff. Thank you.